Good afternoon, everybody. It is the uh, 30th of August. It's Wednesday, uh, last Wednesday in August here, and uh, you're here at Lunch and Learn. We're getting folks unmuted. We're going to be recording this, so uh, hopefully people keep yourselves muted if you're not going to ask a question. So we have any background dogs and doorbells, you know, and things like that. Um, today we're going to start part one of this whole concept you've seen, looking at things from a functional neurofeedback, holistic sort of biopsychosocial model, <clears throat> and how that pertains to the work we do here with the new mind mapping system and the ISI and the CEC and the physiology, et cetera. So we're going to start off with Richard uh, talking about the whole concept of uh, functional neurofeedback, and then uh, we'll start talking about pieces of the map, and that's where uh, with the physiology, well, we, Judy and uh, Veronica will really kick in because they're both, uh, you know, nurses and in the health field. And my role on this will be to offer some supportive comments and trying to bring it into focus from the standpoint of looking at ethics and scope of practice, because that's a big issue in our field right now and want to make sure people are all above board. So, Richard, it's all yours. Yeah, okay. So, I started a conversation with Rob for a paper on functional neurofeedback um, uh, about a year or two ago, about two years ago, I think it was. Yep. And uh, uh, he liked it a lot. So um, we're, we still have, are, have yet to finish it, but I presented the ideas at ISNR. And it come, the functional neurofeedback comes from the idea of functional medicine. And uh, I felt that this was a model, holistic model, that should be used in neurofeedback. It should sp it's important to spread the idea of using it because uh, it does make the bar higher on ethics um, in a way that's different uh, than most people emphasize because it's client uh, centered. It's 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 about how your client uh, reacts individually. Uh, it's not about one size fits all. And so um, functional medicine uh, seeks to treat the source of patients um, rather than just treating the symptoms and forces the practitioner to transcend the, the one size fits all approach to acute care. And this is the kind of thing that Mark Hyman has promoted. We've been doing this I didn't know Mark Hyman existed, but <laughs> we've been doing this with Rob. I've been doing this with Rob since 2008. Rob knew he, he existed, but I didn't. Uh, um, and we've always taken that approach. Um, uh, disease is a descriptor of a pathological endpoint uh, and function. It's about the sources of pathological process and how it's shaped by multiple uh, causal factors in a biological system. So that's it. Disease really just describes the sim symptomology of a of an Im of a sense of an imbalance or a, uh, general disorder in the physiology, and it manifests in different ways. This goes back to the diathesis st uh, stress model of um, disorder. And the idea that people manifest their disorder based upon the genetic heritage and their window of vulnerability. So where they are most vulnerable at their most uh, f functional level is, is how disease um, characterizes itself and how it uh, shows up, you know. This you know, one type, another type, another type, uh, are all um, distinguished by the things that go wrong, you know, and then they categorize them. But this is more of a systems approach. Um, and uh, it's been recognized in JAMA, um, and there's an Institute of Functional Medicine. So, in a sense, we're promoting the idea a functional neurofeedback because up to this point if there's been a failure uh, in the healing process 
it's considered a technological failing. I mean, the technological failing uh, uh, or the um, training of the physician or the knowledge base of the physician towards the um, particular category of problems they have. Uh, so in neurofeedback, you know, if, if you couldn't uh, help somebody out, you know, then it must be the technology. You know, it, it comes from naive belief that neurofeedback is a fix-all panacea that can do anything. And it, it was very uh, misleading and, uh, for us to think that we had a technology that could cure everything. But that was kind of the, the image it had. I mean, I don't think uh, only a few people thought that it was uh, really that way, but it had that tint and that, well, maybe, maybe it can, you know, if you just get the nervous system right and train it right, everything will fix itself. So it was kind of functional in its early perspective, but it, it made the error of believing in itself too much. And as a consequence, we got more and more exotic um, methods. As a matter of fact, the methods far outstripped um, the possibility of usage. Uh, for instance, we had uh, QEG programs that you had special databases and computers, you had to uh, um, have all this uh, really uh, incredible training uh, to understand them. I had to know an immense amount about statistics and math and uh, electronics theory. And I suppose most of you think it's already, it's still that way, but it was far worse then. And I would get a, a 30 page report of cross tabs, you know, and uh, just numbers, you know, and maybe a few pictures. And I would give it to my friends at meetings and say, um, can you explain everything on this report? And they couldn't explain 10% of it. And I would say, well, what happens if you have to explain it in court? <laughs> you know, trying to get people to come down to earth. And then I got, got some of the people thinking. But that was really advanced technology. And then we had uh, software that got even farther advanced. I mean, the software is so ahead of the field, uh, it's almost dangerous. Uh, and that's why I uh, developed NewMind, in a sense, to uh, counter that, that flow of uh, that direction, that drive, uh, to get more and more complex, because it makes it too complex. You know, in medicine, you never see a, a, an instrument uh, that has got billions of buttons. They've only got a couple of buttons because there's too much going on for people to start thinking a lot about what they're doing. They have to respond to training. So um, to move people away from that hyper-focus on the technology and that it was a failing of technology, and to get them to start looking with a broader picture, like any scientist would. If it didn't work, what were the confounds? And there's a whole lot of them. Uh, there's a million of them. It's almost overwhelming. But we have to look at them. We have to find some way to deal with them. Um, so th this is some of the key features of functional medicine, and it applies to us. Uh, it addresses the root cause rather than just the symptoms. It recognizes the, conf the complexity of contributing factors to, to disease. It promotes optimal wellness. Uh, assessment requires a detailed understanding of each patient's genetic, biological, and lifestyle factors. It's individualized. It's patient-centered. Uh, patient and practitioner work together. Uh, I wish I could tell the people in the ER to do that. Um, <laughs> it, it empowers uh, the patient. Again, you know, you don't have much power once you go to the hospital. It is a science-based uh, 
but not RCT dominant. In other words, it's uh, uh, random control designs. The random control design is not everything. Well, it can't be. Human beings are complex. The random control de design was developed by the Department of Agriculture to deal with uh, plants. <laughs> I mean, that's where uh, modern statistics came from, agriculture, the agriculture department. Um, and you can't apply statistics and research methods to humans that you can to plants. I mean, you can to a limited degree, but then it fails. You have to do um, you know, a different type of research, qualitative. So you have to involve the qualitative approach as well as the quantitative approach. And you have to bring them together. And uh, uh, so it, um, it's a science not totally based on RCT. And they say, well, you haven't proven by multiple uh, uh, designs uh, that uh, test that this actually works. And you still have people out there saying, well, no, feedback, I don't know if it works. Meanwhile, we've got 300, 400, now probably 500, even more. Um, uh, experiments showing that it works and a, uh, quite a large number of those are uh, RCT designed. Um, they don't have huge samples <laughs> but neither does any MRI research either. Um, but with that much volume you, you have to assume sooner or later that it works. It's, yeah. uh, and then uh, it considers lifestyle a critical factor, lifestyle critical factor. Yeah, and that's important. You know, Richard, there's this piece I'll be sending out when I send up that next science reports, and it's from Johns Hopkins. And the title, it was about misdiagnosis. Let me read this paragraph. It just tells yeah, us too. even more. It says, according to a recent report from the Johns Hopkins Armstrong Institute Center for Diagnostic Excellence, 795,000 Americans a year die or are permanently disabled after being, one, misdiagnosed. Yeah. 371,000 patients die and 424 are permanently disabled. That's just from incorrect diagnoses. So again, when you're looking at, as you were saying, I mean, when you're looking at medicine, symptom pill, symptom procedure, symptom surgery, and not looking at the cause, that plays a big role in misdiagnosis, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, that can't be emphasized enough. But more than that, it's it's a failure in even helping the person, never mind dying, but not being able to, to help them. Uh, and I have been amazed, absolutely dumbfounded sometimes, when I've gotten at the, uh, uh, at the uh, root cause of, of the problem. And it was over a period of sometimes six months, eight months of working with the central nervous system and asking questions. I didn't even know what the problem was till six months in. And I began to assume that I didn't know. And each person was a work in progress. And that's very much uh, uh, the uh, uh, clinician in, in psychology and uh, counselors and functional neurofeed, I mean functional um, uh, chiropractic, that's kind of the way it is. You assume that you don't know anything, that you're not going to know anything right away. It's going to be a long process of tests and questions and exploring. You know, and you you try something briefly you watch for the response, you sit down, you analyze it in, 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 re, in relationship to what you know at this point, and then you make a conclusion. And then you do that all over again. And then you do that all over again. And you do that ad nauseum until slowly you build an understanding. And you never know exactly what, what's going on, but you get close enough so that the person begins to heal. And that's why we have all the assessments available, at least in our system. And if you don't have the new mind system, you can you can buy the assessments. I um, 
all those things I have in the new mind system were commercially available under uh, as a product under another name in another field. I just brought them together in one and re reproduced ones that were specific to neurofeedback, but I used the same criteria um, because I I felt I had had to have that myself. It was really about me and I wanted that. Uh, I wanted that software so that I could make those decisions based upon information. Um, so um, that is uh, in sharp contrast to tradi uh, the tr traditional um, perspective. Now, traditional neurofeedback is fairly benign. Um, and maybe the more advanced parts are, you know, like uh, doing Loretta Z score, uh, um, but it tends to be a gating mechanism for people with a lot of money and a lot of time to, <laughs> to learn. Um, and a lot of clinicians are not, don't have that resource and don't want it. Um, and no doubt uh, things will progress that way, but we can't assume that you know, it's uh, a panacea and it's just a failure of technology because too many people are suffering with that perspective and we aren't helping them enough. So uh, we aren't here to fix people by zapping them on an ROI. We're here to understand them in the context of their lives and see if we can make that minor adjustment that makes them a little bit better and able to manage life and hopefully down the road making them a lot better so i won't take up any more time uh with, with the concept uh and maybe we can move on unless somebody has a comment to make Any questions from anybody thus far from a definitional standpoint? All right. Okay. Well, we can, let's, we can start with just talking about some of the parts of the mapping system. And let's start with physiology since it ties pretty closely into functional medicine and therefore functional neurofeedback. Yeah. <laughs> you have a physiology? You yeah, have one that you book. Okay, let me turn the. I'm, I'm off the hook. I've been in bed for two days. So I'm not really <laughs> coherent. <laughs> there you go. Well, anyway, while you're getting, okay, there we go. Oh, you're, you're giving me the screen. Okay, well, let me pull up the new mind mapping system. Give me a moment, folks. And and one of the things that uh, you know we've we've emphasized here for so long. And uh, by the way, we do have. Um, uh, a sample of a of a map that we could uh, show people uh, that Judy did, where someone gives you a bunch of information and it doesn't fit with the map at all. So if you're wanting any examples, let us know, and we'll give that screen to Judy. But here's your here's your physiology, folks. And um, this is just a demo, so I, this is not a, a real patient, and I just filled in a bunch of blanks to show it. But when you think about um, creating a new assessment or getting one started, this is how it looks if you haven't done these. It gives you a symptom. It gives you a severity rating from nothing to very mild, mild, unpleasant, very pleasant, unbearable. And then it gives you the frequency, rarely, sometimes, often, very often, all the time. And sometimes you'll see us when we're going over a map, we'll scroll down. Uh, Judy and Veronica will in particular say, can we scroll down and take a look at how they rated that symptom? Because that's, you know, pretty important, uh, especially when you get into a high score. Is everything like horrible all the time? Is it somebody who's over-reporting would be one thing to pay attention to, or someone in many more cases under-reporting. And you'll hear Richard, myself, Veronica, Judy say, oh, well, this, thing, this is obviously an under-report. You've got somebody with a horrible-looking map in there. Physiology scores 11. And oftentimes, it's done. it can be done with a kid where a parent's just not really in tune. 
And so I'll tell my mentees, I'll say, look, either you sit down with, have the parents sit down with the kid again and say, this isn't, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense given the map. And the map will tell us certain things and it'll even in that narrative give us, you know, certain things to look for or, or that are apparent in the map. And when you start seeing notes that say check physiology or physiological things or inflammation, uh, a low score in a physiology is just someone who's not really necessarily giving you all the <clears throat> all the information. Then I'll say you need to sit down again. This doesn't fit. Or if they can't seem to do that, I recommend that you as the clinician sit down with that child yourself and, and go over that physiology. If parent wants to be present, great. But it's important for us to understand the various health aspects of it. And I can't emphasize that um, any stronger than, than um, I am right now, because when I was attending uh, the lectures at the uh, um, uh, ISNR conference, most of the keynoters, most of the plenary sessions that were invited speakers and most of the workshop presenters I attended all referenced functional medicine so that concept is coming into play and uh during one of uh the talks that dave and uh, rusty were doing and rusty's with us today and rusty you feel free to chime in anytime you <laughs> want to add something please um you know they were talking about you know how these things affect our health and I was uh, noting back and forth with some of the attendees that were virtual like me about, you know, functional neurofeedback and the whole concept. So what we're, we're talking about is just something that, to help make this whole sense of how we do an intake and how we manage a client coming into our office uh, from, a, uh, as Richard was saying, more of a holistic biosocial cycle model, because as you've heard him say, you've heard us say, if you go back to the YouTube channels, when Rusty gave talks about his sort of model, the meds model, you know, exercise, diet, sleep, and managing screen time, that's the meds model. And now he's added some other things to it because the electromagnetic fields and his talk was excellent on that. Um, these are all important aspects that affect our health. And to not understand those is how I think we get into situations where you, you don't have a good you're working with a diagnosis that doesn't seem to fit your map or someone doesn't have a good diagnosis or we're missing some sort of point because all those aspects affect who we are as people and how we function and especially how we function from a brain aspect. So I invite Judy, Veronica. Yeah. If you give me the screen, to... I'll give you a dramatic one. All for right. Example. Yeah. So pop okay. me over the screen a moment. Yep. Okay. And I'm just going to show you a score that kind of widened my eyes and uh, to just give you an example of how this has to be considered. Okay, so go. this is a woman that came in and look at this score. <laughs> so it's it's like, whoa, it stops me in my tracks because I get concerned. Can I help her with neurofeedback if she doesn't handle some of what's been going on here? Okay, so these this is... And what I know is I want the score to be somewhere and uh, between 50 and 75, let's say, on your average. This, this person, this is a young woman at 20. I would like her score to be 40. She walked in with this score, and these, this was some of the symptoms. And you know, surprise, surprise, she says she has panic, you know? But this is what can come. And if... If I didn't have this, my conversation would have been totally different. Totally different, right, Veronica? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I I remember this case, and I think Hannah also had another case too that had an extremely high score too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is when you start to really um, ask more questions as to, you know, when was your last visit with the doctor? You know, did they ever have labs? What has your doctor said? Um, any other medical diagnoses maybe that they um, haven't shared yet? But this is definitely someone who um, is really reporting and being transparent with their health that something isn't okay. And I thought long and hard about did I want to do neurofeedback before some of this metabolic was taken care of? 
And I made the decision that 20 years old, that I would be, uh, I would not be spending her money wisely, I thought, to do the neurofeedback before she got some of this in order. And I think we are divided on that. I don't think there's anything that drives the opinion fully one way or the other. You know, neurofeed, uh, she was of limited means. And that, and that's one, if, if mm. somebody had a, said to me that money isn't an object, then I might do some calming neurofeedback while they work on this. But I made the decision with hey, this Judy. one year old. Yeah, go ahead. This is Tiffany K. Goldschrift. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with the, the physiology, but I will say one of the things that I have learned over the last few years is that people who are in heightened emotional states report a lot of physical symptoms, even though it may mean that they don't have anything physiologically or metabolic going on. And so, like, I've had clients, obviously not with this high of score, but maybe 160, 170, and they redo the physiology, and it goes down between, like, 60 and 80. So that's something I've really kind of come to see as a pattern also. Um, but I do think the physiology score is super helpful, you know, if we feel like they need to go to a doctor. But that heightened emotional state in some people, I feel like, can drive physical symptoms that aren't actually physiologically based. Does that make sense? That, it makes beautiful yeah, sense, Tiffany. That makes a lot of sense. Let me let me add to what you said that when we're looking at those kinds of folks, I think oftentimes, and you've heard uh, Veronica and Richard and Judy and I talk about the map and the dashboard. When that CEC is lit up like a Christmas tree, what I say to the patient is, when you know when you know you don't uh, sleep well nothing feels or works well. So oftentimes those people in those highly emotional states like you're describing have poor sleep and that begins to affect the physiology scores in a way that you're sort of describing. But the other side of that I wanna throw out to Judy and, and, and Veronica and Richard and anybody else is people walk in your office and you'll ask them about, you know, they're on medications and you ask them about head injury and they'll sometimes tell you they've had a head injury. And then you ask, did any of your providers providing you meds and giving you diagnosis ever ask you that question? And you will hear more times than not, no. So well, that's, that's one of the things that happens. It's an example. It's one, one singular example of how people can get a misdiagnosis because they, they're not asking proper questions or something, you know, doesn't, you know, it doesn't look right, but they're not digging deeper, if you will, and that's what I'm calling it, digging deeper. So we have to ask more of these questions about physiological health when things seem to be a little unusual. And again, let everybody else, everyone else chime in but when they make that point. Yes, I, I agree. Um, I guess just my background as being a, a registered nurse, um, you know, when I see a physiology like this, it just leads me as to how long you've been feeling this way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, has this been going on for months? Has it been going on for weeks? Did you just, you know, what, whatever the traumatic event, did it lead to this? Or I start to try to really um, ask more questions as to just looking at it and say, oh, great, thanks for reporting all this. It looks like, you know, um, there's a lot going on here. So, I, you know, taking it further, obviously, how long has this been going on? Really important question, yeah. So this is a more average one that I get between 120 and 180 from, I get that a bunch. So, and this one I'll, I will work with neurofeedback. I, uh, it's rare that I will not do some neurofeedback with somebody based on a physiology score, but there are times I think they really need to get some medical help. And honestly, Veronica, you've had a big influence on me around checking labs and looking at those kind of things because it's not it's not the norm of how i think uh, my my nursing background is a long time ago my therapy background gets into gear and says what are these symptoms which of these symptoms can i kind of say is a, a manifestation of what's going on emotionally for them but you've got me thinking more about the labs and that's another really conversation useful. Mm -hmm. Another conversation I have with clients about labs is just because you are within range does not mean that range is optimal for you. And I think that's a hard conversation Correct. for many, 
many clients to have. I'm a counselor just like Judy, but I think it's a hard conversation for clients to have with their doctors because we're just kind of checking things off the list, but we're not really analyzing what's best for you, which again kind of goes into this whole awesome webinar about what's good and what's best for a client, not what's within range for a population. Makes so much sense, Tiffany, definitely. I think about that, for example, around D3, that I have people that are very satisfied when they're registering 20 to 30, and they say, my doctor says it's okay, but in my reading, we want that to be in the higher register of norm, you know? And so I've had clients who say, you wrote down that I should take D3 plus K2, but my doctor told me to stop it because my level was 26. I say the range is like 20 to 100. And my, from my reading, functional medicine people like it higher, you know? So it's, uh, and that's a whole, that, that becomes, difficult in the conversation. Yeah, and to support Tiffany's comment earlier when she first made a, comments about high scores. Yeah, Tiffany, uh, you know, with a high score, um, we're not saying don't start neurofeedback unless there's a resource issue like Judy was talking about. But if you start trying it in hopes you can maybe get them sleeping a little bit better, which oftentimes will help, that's great. But if after, you know, maybe uh, five or 10 sessions, they're telling you nothing's happening, that's when I think we need to step back and say, okay, you know, let's look at what's happening at a physiological level that may be causing you to not respond well. Honestly, I don't always know what to do about the physiology when it's really high. I, I, I'm not trained in that, you know? I mean, I know some basic medical stuff because I was a nurse many years ago, but I'm not really trained in what to do. So what I wanna do is get people to the right people. You know, and, and sometimes they're resistant to doing it. Sometimes what happens is we do neurofeedback for a while, then we do a compare map and it hasn't changed like we think it ought to. And then we go back to, so here were my recommendations. And you see over here, did we follow through on that? Or are you taking these? I only put in some basic supplements for good neurotransmitter production that I learned from Dr. Suter years ago, you know? And um, so then we go back and say, so, you know, let's look at the other factors. What are the other factors for functional neurofeedback thoughts? Uh, and sometimes that's the only way to make inroads. Yeah, you know, um, when, I mean, I guess it's for us here, um, you know, James, so he works in the emergency room and he also um, has a practice here and I do the brain mapping and the neural feedback. And the reason why he opened up the practice was because when in the emergency room, people were coming in for things that he says, I think your doctor should take care of this. And he would write a note and they would go back and they'd come back and they'd say, they don't know, they don't know what to do with that. <laughs> so he's just like, I need, you know, I, I think I need to open something. So it was a very small little, you know, one room that he was renting from someone else. And it just got a little bit bigger and bigger from there. Um, but, you know, as in, in the ER, you know, people are coming in with lots of medications, um, you know, underlying factors of PTSD, anxiety, suicidal ideation. Um, and then he'll go over the meds and some of these medications, like, why are you on these? And they have multiple doctor names. So I think that's a key thing. If someone is on medications, check to see how many prescribers are there in this person's mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. because yeah. That will say a lot about what's going on with them. And in most cases, people will say, I don't, I don't remember this doctor, or that was about two years ago, but he's still feeling my medication. Um, so you know, that's the, obviously, as we know, that's a driver for neurofeedback when people are on medication. So I'm, I'm an advocate for the, for the client when they're, when they're here and they start with me. Um, and, and I ask a lot of questions. My, my consultation, my intakes, they're about an hour and a half because I know it's going to take a little bit more time for me to say, do they start with us? Um, do they need to see the um, a dentist? Because one of our questions is, when was the last time you saw a dentist? Sometimes they'll say, you know, since a kid, because I had trauma, I don't want to go back, I'm scared. So I know someone that we usually refer people to. 
Um, so I, I try to create this little plan for them to start with. And if they're on board, then I know that we can work together. Um, but the, you know, there are people who just want to not do a lot and take a shortcut, but Hey, you know, we're all about the results. Let's sustain this. Let's get you better for the quality of life. Um, and when I think of functional medicine, I think of that is more quality. You know, where do you see yourself in five years, two years, a month, you know, six months? Great points. Um, and, and and actually, uh, what uh, Rusty put out on our listserv, so I'm not, you know, sharing any secrets. He said, you know, lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. He said, this is one of the things that he really thinks our group works well with. But he said, lifestyle it can be contributing and often causing the multitude of symptoms and EEG changes, just how we run our lives. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. I think sometimes people just need to hear, you know, how we can help organize their, they can see it in a different way. I mean, again, um, as I'm not, I'm not a, you know, a therapist like many of you. So I learned so much about what you do and how you connect with your client. Um, I'm focusing more on, you know, the um, the physiology and how that's helping them. And I connect them to a therapist because that's important for us as well. So I always make sure that that's connected, that they have someone. Um, I like to send out an email like, hey, your client's doing well. This is what we're doing, just so that they are part of it. And the ISI, I know we haven't gotten to that part, but I always like to include them Hey, I'm not sure if this is something you've been talking about, but this is really important. They've they've talked about this multiple times with me, and maybe it's already something that they're already discussing. But I like to um, be part of that paradigm um, for this client to, um, so that they know that they're not just like, well, can you talk to them? Or, Am I supposed to do this? Um, you know, just those small things like they really feel like, hey, someone's really helping me, and you can really promote health that way. They start to feel better. Someone's caring. Very well said. Something else that I try to get into a little bit is what they're putting in their body in terms of their diet. And mm -hmm. that's a difficult conversation to have with people and to make changes in there. And um, so I, Bill, in the physiology time is when I'm talking about the strength of the gut-brain connection and how much more science is discovering about the strength of the gut brain connection and i'll write them i'll write that down that they should read about leaky gut and that they should understand what is the microbiome and how does it influence anxiety so i'll write them little notes in my like plan sheet about things they can look up to try to understand or i direct them to porges's polyvagal theory and I'm sure other people do things similarly or even more, and I'd love to hear that from others. I try to say anti-inflammatory diet or Mediterranean diet and try to say, read about that, you know, um, because I don't want to step outside the realm of what I, I know. So I don't go big into different supplements, even though I know there are a ton that a lot of these people ought to be on to try to remedy some of their circumstances. I'd love to hear what other people do in that regard because it's a slippery slope to talk to people about what they're what they're eating. Yeah, well, if I, Judy, just to start, and hopefully others will chime in. If I, because I'm not a nutritionist, a dietitian, nor a physician, I often refer people. I'll say I print out that physiology checklist, the whole thing with their answers, and say take this to your doctor or your prescriber. Or I'll say, you need to sit down with a nutritionist and a dietitian and really look at your diet when they describe, you know, a really bad diet. You know, people on the go all the time, they're eating fast foods, grab a grab a Pop-Tart in the morning and out the door into your car you go with a coffee. And people that drink the big gulp sodas for breakfast, you know, 32 ounces of uh, <laughs> artificial sweetener mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. and so forth. So those are the people I, I, I say, you know, from a scope of practice standpoint. You know, we don't want to get ourselves in trouble. So I say, this is who you need to talk to. When I worked in the clinic, I had a doctor, I had a nutritionist and a dietitian right there. So I could just make in-house referrals. But if you don't, when we talk, and you've heard us say this so many times, all four of us, 
you need to have a good referral source, a network of people that you refer to that know what you do and know why you're referring to them and that will work with you and help that patient. So I'm curious, do other people address this when they're doing an assessment or is it something you kind of leave to the side because it's an overwhelming <coughs> issue to talk about? Diet. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah Judy, ahead. I want to jump, jump in. Um, I, I think this has been really, really helpful because I can go from feeling overwhelmed, you know, this patient needs early in eye therapy, needs uh, physical therapy, needs... Uh, you know, medication monitoring, blah, blah. And if I'm feeling overwhelmed, the poor patient is probably going to feel overwhelmed. And sort of, uh, I'm conceptualizing it. We can, we want to sort of wear the neurofeedback hat because that's our specialty in many cases. But if we also have the therapist hat, uh, if we have a medical background, we can maybe offer them a little bit more in some of the other arenas. But in general, depending on the this patient situation, resources in your community, sometimes being a case manager and seeing if they did take that information into their doctor and then what did the doctor do about it? Did they blow them off? Do you need to like help them find a different doctor? Um, sometimes we can jump in with neurofeedback if someone's like unmotivated and maybe help with some frontal lobe activity to get them more motivated to follow through on some of the recommendations and making them all up front can be overwhelming. I know there's testing people in my area that give six pages of boilerplate recommendations for everybody and nobody ever follows through on it because they, you know, they want the kids to get tutoring, they want special mass tutoring, they need um, psychotherapy, they need psychopharm, they need blah, blah, blah. So sometimes we have to kind of not bite off more than we can chew and be there for the person in a supportive and encouraging way um, and seeing if they're following up with some of the other recommendations that we're making. At the same time, I like the idea of, you know, working on the neurofeedback for sleep to help get them in better shape to alter, start altering their physiology that way. And then down the road, start dealing with dietary issues and, you know, a husband that doesn't want <laughs> a vegetarian diet at home and things mm. like that. Oh, yeah. Very well said, Michael. I totally agree with you in staging it, you know. I write it down, but I don't push. Yeah, I've, I've pushed, and then, you know, they run off to try and find somebody integrative, and everybody's got a waiting list or they're not taking their insurance and whatnot and then you're scratching your head and you never see them again you wonder if you, they did them a service versus scheduling some sort of follow-up and supportive stuff initially as well as some neurofeedback to help them feel better enough to follow through with some of the other issues one thing that got driven home to me last week was i had a, a a new person come in and the wife came with and she is a, a child psychiatrist and had never heard of neurofeedback beyond the word, knew nothing about it and it was for her husband, you know? And I realized that these people are often going to physicians who don't understand. I've had conversations with physicians of some of my patients and had to explain what neurofeedback is, how it works, and how I think it can help their patient. You know, um, more than, more th at least 50% of the time of contacting physicians, they don't know anything about it or they know the word. That's amazing in this, uh, after uh, 50 years. <laughs> It really is. Yep. Yeah. I mean, neurofeedback was on Connie Chung 22 years ago. Oh, How did yeah. they miss that? How did they miss that? <laughs> and recently, most recently on uh, Netflix in that series Quarterback, 
in episode four, the quarterback does neurofeedback before entering the training. And you see it. You see him on his phone. It's, he's doing it right in the car before he goes to work. Well, they know about it now in sports. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. That's that's for sure. Oh, they see a successful quarterback. They're going to run for it. All right. Well, I hope it just uh, I, continues to push out more and more. You know? Well, one thing I have noticed on the metabolic uh, assessment, this one in particular, uh, the, the score, the changes in their map uh, on these higher scores happen faster than the changes in their score. It's an interesting phenomenon. That kind of goes along with what Tiffany uh, was saying. You know, it's uh, they report changes a lot s slower because they're uh, uh, they have so many physical problems. It gets amplified by the amount of problems they have and uh, they're they're so overwhelmed so that's a good thing to know when you're not to look for rapid changes in the metabolic score when you do neurofeedback but have them come back a year and and report and, you'll, and it's usually you'll see it's significant change so do you think to repeat the metabolic, the physiology test every, let's say they're in, I have somebody with me like at the three month point to, I, I haven't done this, but Tiffany's comments made me think, maybe I could set something up where at three months of, of training or X amount yeah. of sessions, I have them repeat the physiology score to see the impact. So oh, I, I do that. that, Judy, like I'm, I'm very, I, with people I mentor, I hammer this home that those assessments are there for us to help us understand progress. I mean, I did it today. I set some, I reset someone's physiology, their ISI and their CEC. And I said, okay, it's time to redo these. I am so, you know, excuse my language, anal retentive about that <laughs> because those are our tools. Those are our tools to help us understand progress. And I, I use them. I maximize them to our advantage for that very reason. Good for you. That's, um, I think, I think you may have spoken about this a few weeks ago, but, um, on, on doing that. And I, I would do this with some of my clients, but I have since changed uh, my process because of that. So I want to say thank you. And what is your name? What is, Tiffany. 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 Oh. Oh, hey. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tiffany. Thank no, you. you're fine. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. You're, absolutely. So I think the, the next phase that we're going to bring in will be the ISI. Uh, that'll be coming forward on Friday and then pulling it together. Uh, I I had an interesting uh, fellow with a metabolic score of 40 and ISI that looked perfect and had a horrible map of exhaustion and yet how he presented in his papers, you know, it was, it just made everything about how I assessed it so much more complete. And that's what happens when we learn more and more about how to use these assessments we get a completer picture. You could just see his face. It was like, I'm reading his mail because I didn't listen to what he presented. I combined it with the neurofeedback and said, you say this, but this is what is in front of me. And you could see in his eyes that he got it, that I got it. You know, it's very powerful. These are very powerful assessments. I undervalued them. For, for my first few years, I thought they were just a little pain in the butt that I had to do, you know, and they have grown so important to me, like the dashboard becoming in, in a map becoming so much more important as an understanding of who these people are, because we we try very quickly to get a sense of them. And it's hard. Like you say, Tiffany, you spend an hour and a half 
or Veronica rather, you spent an hour and a half. Uh, me too, but golly, that's, uh, you know, sometimes feels like spitting in the wind as far as understanding who's in front of you. Right. These are such helps. And I think another thing that, and I don't see that that's going to be part of the discussion, but hopefully we kind of add that in. But, you know, the cognitive part, the, the cognitive um, assessment, test. Also, the performance testing that's also available with New Mind is important, too. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about it. Awesome. But we're kind of at a good stopping point for today since we're at the top of the hour, folks. So we're going to continue this discussion on Friday, and that's when we'll go into the, uh, the ISI and the CEC and the cognitive performance tests and how they all help play a role, too. Because the reason you want to look at those tests quickly is there's times when people will tell you they have a certain thing with memory or attention deficit. They take those tests, and they don't score anywhere near problematic. Sometimes they say they have attention deficit and they, they score in the upper range. It's like, you know, they have really good attention or really good memory in a certain way. So um, they can help sometimes rule out, you know, some of the issues going on, like, you know, whether this is a, really an ADHD case or something different. So Friday, we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, hopefully everybody here will join us. I think these are being recorded. We hopefully will be posting these. Uh, Aaron and Richard will go over them and then uh, give you a date. And we'll see everybody here on Friday. Continue part two. <laughs>